<coughs> well, we're certainly remarkable times and look forward to uh, the thank Brother Jim and Sister Margaret for coming and look forward to your update. Thanks, Brother Jim. Thanks, Tim. I think uh, we'll dispense with the reading uh, just for the sake of a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, thank you for inviting us down here and for that lovely lunch that we had just a short while ago. Um, I'm going to talk this afternoon as much as I can on relevant Bible prophecy and the things that are happening in our, in our world. But I want to start with the package of signs since 2015. And when you reflect upon this, brothers and sisters, we've waited a long time. I've been in the truth for 55 years or more. And, you know, through that 55 years, I was baptised in 1967, February 67, which was the Six Day War. That was a huge event. And you look back on that, and there have been significant things that have happened, but nothing, nothing that even remotely as good as what we've seen in the last six or seven years. So a very quick review of what's happened in this period. And what's God trying to say to us, to us do you think? He's, I think he's saying, look, you've waited a long time, you've been patient, now look at this. Look at this package of things that are happening that are clearly fulfilling Bible prophecy. I can't do any more for you. If you cannot see what I'm up to here, then I'm sorry. I can't do any more. So that's why I think it's important to review what has happened since 2015. Now, it was in September of 2015 that the Russians, of course, entered into the Syrian conflict. And they're still there. And they are encroaching upon Syrian territory. They've got now two ports on the coast. They're stationing ships in those two ports. They are gaining ground in Syria. And, of course, the day will come when Scripture says they'll take it over anyway, right across to Pakistan. And that they'll become then the king of the north. I'm not going to talk about that today, but that's what's in the future. So Israel said at the time, Netanyahu said Israel has a Russian border now. Isn't that interesting? They've got a Russian border. In June 2016, Britain voted to leave the European Union. That was a huge event. It was against the odds. They thought the yes vote to remain in Europe would easily win. But of course, God had different ideas. And he sent a storm from, from Belgium, from the very capital of the European Union in Brussels, they never come from there. But this series of storms did on the 16th of, of June uh, 2000, uh, on the, what was the date? 26th, I think it was. Uh, 26th, well, somewhere in that period. That yeah, uh, when was the 24th? Anyway, whatever, doesn't matter. 2016, he sent that storm on that day and there was flooding all through the London area and many people couldn't get to the polling booths. And it didn't matter what time they went, they were, they were blocked off. And two million people, they say, couldn't vote on that day. And the, and the no vote won by 1.7. Right? It's a little bit like the events of, of Dunkirk in 1940, where there was clearly divine intervention to bring to pass something that was quite remarkable. So we know that God's been at work. 2017, of course, Trump's first year in office promoted peace between Israel, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf States. That didn't look likely, did it? But Trump had a Jewish son-in-law and he sent him over there as the ambassador. Look at it now. We've got the Abraham Accords. We've got peace being built between Israel and its former enemies. Why is that important? Well, you can see Ezekiel 38 verse 13 there. That verse, of course, speaks about Britain not being part of Europe, but being uh, in opposition to Gog's uh, invasion of the land. And it also speaks about Sheba and Dedan, the nations of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, that Persian Gulf area, being part of the opposition to the Gogi invasion. So the whole thing was turned upside down from what it used to be. In December 2017, the Likud party decided to push for the annexation of the West Bank. And they're working on that progressively. Even this current government's working on that. Because, you see, Gog doesn't come down upon the mountains of Palestine because they wanted to make that a Palestinian state. Mm -hmm. Gog comes down upon the mountains of Israel. Ezekiel 38, verse 8, requires the West Bank to be part of Israel proper at the time of Armageddon. Okay? And so God's working on that one as well. In 2018, we have, of course, the activity of an organisation called CANZUK. It means it's an, it's an acronym for Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom, trade organisation. And of course, this is Ezekiel 38, 13, isn't it? Tarshish, Britain and the young lions, they're all. It says the merchants of Tarshish. So the emphasis on trading 
And that's exactly what's happened. China's uh, problems with Australia, of course, is forcing Australia to trade with India and Britain and other uh, uh, parties that belong to this group, the Young Lions group. They wouldn't have done it otherwise, see? But the angels are active to make sure it happens. 2019, as I said, Australia's relationship with China drastically changed and it's forcing Australia to do certain things like, for example, last year they, they, they had a, an agreement, a, a free trade agreement with Britain signed. They're still working through the detail of that. But here we are. We've got Australia now going to do a lot more trade with Britain. The merchants, the Tarshish and the young lines thereof. Scripture always comes to pass, however it may look at the time. It will come to pass. 2020, the COVID pandemic, we know what that's done to the world. It's guaranteed ultimately a global financial crisis uh, due to increasing national uh, debt levels, staggering levels in fact. In early 2021, against the trend you might say, house and property prices skyrocketed. Why? Because people weren't travelling overseas, they had more money so they went into property and buying houses and so the prices went up through the roof. And of course we know what that's going to lead to eventually, the bubble will ultimately burst. I think it's already begun. Mid-2021, the relaxation of many COVID restrictions saw an outburst of eating and drinking and a return to most of the activities listed in Luke 17, 26 to 28. Eating, drinking, buying, selling, building, planning, you know, all the stuff that Christ says was going to happen when he returned. And late 2021, rising inflation. Oh, and you've probably heard a lot about this of late, haven't you? Rising inflation. You know what that, the problem is there? That the more rapidly you increase interest rates, the more you endanger the economies and the stock market in particular. This is what caused, one of the causes of the 1929 crash of the stock market led to the depression. And a bit more about that in a moment. And we are watching that happening right now. Come to this year, 24th of February, you've got Russia invading Ukraine. And of course, we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Sequel 38 verse 2, Gog is of the land of Magog and Prince of Rosh. And we're going to have a look at where the territory of the Rus was, the Rosh uh, of ancient history. In March to June this year, Ukrainian crisis and related sanctions on Russia sent fuel and commodity prices sky high, almost guaranteeing the collapse of the world's financial and economic system later this year. And in April to June, interest rates began to rise rapidly from historic lows. You know, the, the Reserve Bank said a couple of years ago that they would not raise interest rates in Australia until 2024. Would not raise interest rates. They've already raised them, I, I forget what it is now, three quarters of, of uh, 0.75 I think it is. They reckon it will be two and a half by the end of the year. It's going to bankrupt a lot of people. It's going to see them lose their homes. Be, and you add everything else onto the top of that. It's going to be a huge problem. Okay, got a bit of a feel for the things that God's done in the last six or seven years. He's very active and it's telling us something. It's telling us that we are nearing the end. You're all familiar, I think, with Ezekiel 38 and verse 2. This is the literal translations. No matter where you go, the literal translation of the Hebrew is as you see it on the screen. Go, and that's a title, it's a title of a dictator. The, the word actually means the one at the top. Go is of the land of Nago. So that is where he comes from when this invasion occurs. He's called the Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. And when you look at a map, this is one of your maps, Ken, that I, I'm borrowing from you, you can see where these powers are. So you've got Rosh there right in the middle. You see it circled with the purple. And to the, to the northeast of that, you've got Meshach and Tubal. Okay, so Gog's power is based here. And I want to show you how important that particular place is to Vladimir Putin. Historians say that this is the land of Mago. The, 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 you see the red line around that territory? It incorporates Germany on the west, but the largest territory in Mago of, of history is the Ukraine and Belarus. And that was where the Rus established their kingdom in the, in the 900 AD era. And their first capital was Kiev. That's where the, the leaders of the Rus uh, lived. That's, that was their place of rulership. So this was the empire of Vladimir the Great, who is, by the way, uh, Putin's hero. All right? he, he, he models himself on Vladimir the Great. 
and he obviously wants to have the same territory that Vladimir the Great ruled over. So uh, this man, Vladimir Putin, and they say he's got cancer, well, watch, watch that space. Uh, whether it's him or whether it's someone else, these things are going to happen, but he's certainly got all the characteristics that the scripture would require of going, and we'll have to wait and see on that. Uh, um, and I think it will, it will unfold exactly as the scripture requires in due course. He described the fall of the USSR as the greatest geopolitical disaster in history, and he's trying to correct it. And he regards, of course, Ukraine as being part of the Russian nation. So why Vladimir the Great is important to Vladimir Putin, got the same name, it means to rule with greatness. It's derived from the Slavic element vod, to rule, combined with mer, great, or famous. The second element has also been associated with mer, meaning peace or world. So this, is, this was the name borne by the 11th century Grand Prince of Kiev, who was venerated as a saint because of his efforts to Christianise Russia. Now just bear that in mind, because a lot of what's happening now is because of religion. It's because of Putin's connection with the Russian Orthodox Church. And he's modelled himself on this man, Vladimir the First. So let's just step back in time a little bit. Let's go back to towards the end of the last century. To 1997. A Russian political scientist named Alexander Dugin, who happens to be Putin's closest advisor today, all right, wrote a book along with another chap. And it was about the foundation of Russian geopolitical strategy over the next 20 years. So this is 1997. The book was called The Foundations of Geopolitics. And it was all about how Russia could reassert itself in the world. And chillingly, the book now reads like a to-do list for Putin's behaviour on the world stage. Now I'm not going to go through the whole of it, just, just a couple of selections. This book starts out by saying that the shrewd thing to do for Russia would be to steer clear of direct military confrontation, which they've done for a long time. Instead, the book counsels Russian leaders to favour political stealth and, you know, using things like they did in the American election in 2016, you know, getting involved behind the scenes. It argues that Ukraine should, surprise, surprise, be annexed by Russia. So it was Dugan who sowed this seed in Putin's mind. The book's authors say Russia should encourage Britain to leave the European Union. It's 1997, remember, and thus weaken it. That's right. Russian strategists were openly, openly arguing in favour of Brexit in 1997, when it was still just a glimmer in Nigel Farage's eyes. Ukraine is integral to Russia. They first established Kiev as the capital in the land of the Rus. Uh, in 2004, Ukraine elected a democratic European-inclined president. He was poisoned prior to the election. He still won the election. Putin's ally Yanukovych was defeated and Putin humiliated. Putin re retaliated in January 2006, which was right in the middle of a very bad winter, by cutting off gas to the Ukraine, so they froze. He offered $15 billion as a loan to Ukraine, designed to head off Ukraine's drift towards Europe. That failed when his ally uh, Yanukovych was finally ousted from power. So that's a little bit of the background of what's happening today. This, what we're seeing now came from the history of the last 20 years, particularly in that period of 2004 to 2006 when Putin was badly humiliated by Ukraine. Now he has global ambitions. This is from the Carnegie Endowment International for International Peace and this is what they say in this particular article, which was published in February 2019. Success begets more success, and since Putin's return to the presidency in 2012, his record has been enhanced by what Russian officialdom sees as several important wins. The annexation of Crimea, the war in eastern Ukraine, the military deployment in Syria, the tense military standoff with the West in the Baltic and Black Seas. Moreover, the Kremlin's record since 2012 suggests that it will not be deterred or constrained by economic difficulties. The Russian economy has performed poorly since then, with growth hampered by a failure to institute long overdue structural reforms and excessive dependence on exporting hydrocarbons and other raw materials. But, and this is very important in relation to the sanctions that the West has imposed, 
Economic difficulties have not put a break on Russian activism abroad. So they are able to put up with a lot in order to continue on their road. To the contrary, this article said, and, and you know, Western leaders should have read this, shouldn't they? The Kremlin's ability to withstand both domestic economic difficulties and Western sanctions without changing course is a sign of Moscow's commitment to an activist foreign policy as a long-term choice of the country's leadership. See, they're not going to be worried about all these sanctions that have been imposed on them. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt their oligarchs, but it's not going to stop Putin doing what he has planned to do. And I think that's quite important in relation to what we're hearing now. Because we're hearing a lot of reports how he's made this huge mistake and he's lost 50,000 soldiers in the battle and all of these tanks have been destroyed and he's been pushed out of you know, parts of Ukraine. All that stuff's coming from the Western reporters. They don't understand scripture. Scripture says he's going to possess this territory. Go is of the land of Magog. He's the prince of Rosh. He's going to possess the ancient territory of the Rus. And that happens to be Ukraine and Belarus. Okay? So it's going to happen. That's why, of course, this passage in, in Ezekiel 38 about go is very important. You know, we've had, in our community, we've had some difficulties over this particular path, particularly in the 1990s, for example, when the USSR collapsed. We had people saying, oh, well, there you go. there's that business about Russia being go, that's all out of the window now. Sorry. We didn't realise then that we're going to be, we'd still be here some 30 odd years later, all right? But God was at work. And now what we see, of course, vindicates our understanding of this passage of Scripture. This is, of course, uh, Unger's Bible Dictionary commentary on Ezekiel 38 and 39, which he says deal with Gog the prince, so it's a, it's a dictator, and they go his land, he's got that right, described the actual invasion of Palestine as it was when he wrote it's now Israel by a great northern confederacy ostensibly headed up by Russia. He's got that right. The scene depicts a gigantic outburst of anti-Semitism and a colossal attempt to overrun Palestine or Israel and annihilate the Jew. He got that right, you know, so we need to be confident that our pioneer brethren who interpreted Ezekiel 38 and other places did get it right. There's no question about it. And we're now seeing the vindication of that. But this is what I want to emphasise. There are religious underpinnings to the invasion of the land of Israel. And the horrendous persecution of Jews for centuries by the Orthodox religions for what they call blood libel, that is the, the murder of Christ, is legendary. And the Russian Orthodox Church is no better than the Catholic Church in that regard. And Putin, of course, presents himself as a devoted Christian and acts like one of the worst human beings ever born. Mm. All right? But he does present himself as a religious de devotee uh, of the Russian Orthodox Church. He was baptised. <coughs> His Christian mother secretly baptised him at birth, all right? So he has got this heritage and he still wears his baptismal cross today, all right? So here is this man who is one of the worst human beings ever uh, who presents himself as a defender of religion. And here he is, of course, in the presence of the Pope, presenting the Pope with Russian Orthodox Church uh, uh, icons and all that sort of stuff. But you see this gentleman down the corner here, Kirill? When he became the leader of the, of the Russian Orthodox Church in 2004, he became one of Putin's closest allies. And he is an advisor to Putin. And I want to show you the sort of advice that he's been giving to him. But let's just take Putin himself firstly. In his 2013 uh, State of the Nation speech in the Kremlin, he whipped the West with religion. He said, today many nations are revising their moral values and ethical norms eroding ethnic traditions and differences between peoples and cultures. Society is now required to accept without question the equality of good and evil, strange as it seems, concepts that are opposite in meaning. Many Euro-Atlantic countries have moved away from their roots, including Christian values. Policies are being pursued that place on the same level a multi-child family and a same-sex partnership, a faith in God and a belief in Satan. This is the path of degradation. Can you believe those words are coming out of the mouth of Vladimir Putin? Yeah, they did. You see what he's doing? He's actually stolen the high ground, the moral high ground from the, the Christian West. 
It's an unbelievable. And there is a religious motivation behind the invasion of the Ukraine. Here he is with, uh, this is Kirill, right? This is the head of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, who strongly supports Putin. And this is what the, the CNN article of March this year said about that. The top-ranking priest in the Russian Orthodox Church, meanwhile, has offered a very different reason for the invasion of the Ukraine. What is it? Gay pride parades. All right? That's why. Patriarch Kirill said last week that the conflict is an extension of a fundamental culture clash between the wider Russian world and Western liberal values exemplified by expressions of gay pride. So the Ukrainian invasion by Russia on the 24th of February has this underpinning of religion. They're upholding their so-called Christian values, which of course are biblical values, and and saying that the West has completely capitulated to the humanistic spirit of our times, which it has. And so they go on to say, yet experts say that Kirill's comments offer important insights into Putin's larger spiritual vision of a return to a Russian empire in which the Orthodox religion plays a pivotal role. Now, if you think that that's sort of coming from left field, then here's Stan, you know Stan Grant of the ABC? You seen his stuff, Stan Grant? He's quite intelligent, that guy. This is what he said recently. Vladimir Putin cannot separate Ukraine from the Holy Rus, the God-given Russian Empire. I can't talk like Stan Grant, but this is what he said on, on TV. Crimea annexed by Putin in 2014 is the cradle of Russian Christianity, where Prince Vladimir, the leader of Kiev and Rus, converted to the faith in the 10th century. The head of Russian Orthodoxy, Patriarch Kirill, has called Putin a miracle of God. Along with Putin, Patriarch Kirill has revived the idea of Russian world. Vladimir Putin believes the West is decadent. He believes the West has turned away from God and he is a defender of the faith. The man described as Putin's brain, one of the most influential thinkers in modern Russia, Alexander Dugin, remember him? The, two, the 1997 book on geopolitics? Yeah, that's him. So he says that the West is the Antichrist. You get a bit of a, a feel? When you, when you look at what he's saying, he's not that wrong, is he? No, he's not wrong. Yeah. And that's, that's why he's taking stole on the high ground. He yeah. is one of the most ugly creatures on earth, this yeah. man. Yeah. Isn't he? Really fascinating. Isn't that incredible? Oh. What's happening? But you see, the important thing is this. The invasion of the land of Israel is also religiously based. When they come in the land of Israel, in the days of the producer's Armageddon, as a result, it's because of religion. They want the holy site, and we know that from Ezekiel 36. Aha! The ancient holy places are ours in possession, they say, driven by the Russian Orthodox Church, which happens to be still the largest landowner in Israel today. Did you know that? Yeah. yeah. They own a lot of places, including most of the holy sites. Because they were built by, uh, many of them, by Helen, the, the mother of Constantine, okay? She financed it. And of course, they were sent it in Constantinople. And in 1453, when the, when the Muslims turned up, they evicted the Orthodox Church of the East. Where did they go? They went to Moscow. Yeah, and Moscow, life. yeah, Moscow becomes the third Rome, see? And when they get Constantinople back, they're back home, all right? Got the idea? It is unreal what's going on. I thought yeah. Putin had a, a fairly large uh, Jewish upbringing too. One he had yeah, or close connection, things. close connection with the Jewish family. Yeah. yeah. So you know he's got that connection too. He's been using it for, for his own political purposes too, covering up to Israel. Mm -hmm. Because you see, Israel's got to feel as though Russia is not a threat before Armageddon. All right, so he's going to use that, and I could give you a lot of information on that as well. But we won't. We'll go on to what he thinks about this whole affair. He wrote this article, it's a lengthy article, the 12th of July 2021, so it's not even 12 months old. This is what he said. I just made some selections. During the recent direct line when I was asked about Russian Ukrainian relations, I said that Russians and Ukrainians were one people, a single whole. These words were not driven by some short-term considerations or prompted by the current political context. It is what I have said on numerous occasions and what I firmly believe. Now, when Vladimir Putin says he firmly believes something, watch out. 
I therefore feel it necessary to explain my position in detail and share my assessments of, the, of today's situations. Russians, Ukrainians and Belarusians, notice that Belarus comes in here, all descendants of ancient Rus. And he's right. That's where their kingdom was established, which was the largest state in Europe, Slavic and other tribes across the vast territory from Ladoga, Novgorod, Sok and Kiev and Chernigov were bound together by one language, which we now refer to as Old Russian. Economic ties, the rule of the princes of the Rurik dynasty, and, after the baptism of Rus, the Orthodox faith. The spiritual choice made by Saint Vladimir, his hero, who was both Prince of Novgorod and Grand Prince of Kiev, still largely determines our affinity today. Now that's just a couple of little brief excerpts from a very lengthy article by Vladimir Putin on why he's invaded Russia, all right? <laughs> why he's invaded Ukraine, I should say. Okay, get a, get a bit of a feel for that? I mean, this is why it's happening. And it's happening because the scripture says it had to happen. This is what he also said. The throne of Kiev held a, dem a dominant position in ancient Rus. This had been the custom since the late ninth century. The tale of bygone years captured for posterity the words of Oleg the prophet about Kiev. Let it be the mother of all Russian cities. Yeah, and that's why when they invaded, they had this huge column of tanks that came from Belarus, headed straight south towards Kiev. Now they were driven back, all right, they were driven back because they lost a lot of those tanks, etc., and a lot of soldiers, but they'll be back because that was their major aim to take Kiev, to make it the mother of all Russian cities. And Kiev oh, is, is, is in the throes of falling now virtually, isn't well, it? Well, it's, 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 it's under, under uh, a large attack. Uh, attacks by rockets and that sort of thing. And eventually it will become the target. Once they're consolidated in the east, they'll, they'll start on Kiev again. He said the throne of Kiev held a, held a dominant position in ancient Rus. that had been the custom since the late... Did I just read that? Uh, yeah, go on the next paragraph. I am confident that true sovereignty of Ukraine is possible only in partnership with Russia. Our spiritual, human and civilizational ties form for centuries and have their origins in the same source as they have been hardened by common trials, achievements and victories. Our kinship has been transmitted from generation to generation. It is in the hearts and the memory of people living in modern Russia and Ukraine in the blood ties that unite millions of our families. Together we have always been and will be many times stronger and more successful for we are one people. I ask you a simple question. Do you think that Vladimir Putin will retreat? No, he will not retreat, will he? If this war goes on for years, he will continue to destroy Ukrainian cities until they are compelled to surrender. He is going to take that territory. There was an interview on 60 Minutes a little week or so ago. They asked him what he thought about his own people in Russia protesting against the war. And his words were, they're scum. They yeah, should be exactly. Put, thrown in yep. the gutter and trodden on. You've got to be very careful in Russia now. Traitors. Yeah. Mm. You can be in big trouble, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big trouble. with Tucker and a warm bag. You'll be happy. Yeah. I, I feel that this war will drag on for some time if not many months, maybe a year or two, mm -hmm. and eventually they will become exhausted. But I'll tell you what will make them exhausted in the end. That will be the lack of what men depend on. Food, fuel, mm -hmm. right? Things like that, food and fuel particularly, are going to become very, very scarce. Ukraine, you see it's one of the largest countries in Eurasia, mm -hmm. right? apart from Russia itself, one of the largest mm -hmm. territories. It produces 30% of the world's grains, and none of that, none of it is coming out of Ukraine right now. Mm. All right? There's going to be starvation in many countries in the world, particularly in the African continent, mm. and it's already, already started. Already. It's already started. Mm. And of course, we know that the European nations have been dependent on Russian gas and oil. They're desperately trying to find it from elsewhere. Australia is now suffering because of that, because Australian companies, gas companies, are selling it to the Europeans and others for $100 a unit, and they're going to get $6 a unit in Australia. Who would you sell it to? Yeah. All right. if, if you had contracts and you can get $100 per unit for gas, 
Would you sell it to Australian companies for $6 a unit? No. Which is why most, many people on the eastern coast of Australia this winter will freeze. There are companies in New South Wales right now that are spending $100,000 a day on gas for manufacturing. And they can't keep it up. I heard a chap from the unions the other day say that if they don't solve this problem in the next few days, not months, days, many businesses will close their doors because they can't afford it. This is what leads, this is what leads to a crash in the economy. 1930. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm coming to right now. You, you ready for this? Because you see in Luke 17, have a look at Luke 17 with me. In verse 37 of Luke 17, the word day in the singular, or days plural, occurs ten times in that context. Now that's significant. Plural is there five times, and the singular is there five times. Now what does that mean? What it means is this, is that the plural, the days, like the days of the Son of Man, that are mentioned, if you have a look at verse um, 26 of Luke 17, it says, As it was in the days, that's plural days, of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. What does that mean? It means that we're in the days of the Son of Man. And what are they? They are days of opportunity. This is our time. This is like preparation of the ark as a refuge for Noah and his family. This is the period of opportunity. This is when we prepare to enter into the ark when the troubles come. Okay, got that little picture? Same were the days of Lot. They were days of opportunity. He could have got out of that city, he could have done many things, couldn't he? But he didn't do a lot of those things. So what we have here is five plural and five singular. And five we know is the divine number of grace. Right? God's grace. So we are in a period of time that if we use it wisely, it's a period of grace. And if we use it wisely, when the day comes the day referred to in verse 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man cometh, we will find divine grace. We'll be given eternal life. So that's what the Lord's talking about in this context. And of course we're familiar with the times that he refers to. And each of the nine phrases that are used of human activities in verses 26 through to 28, right, has the same, exactly the same grammar in the Greek language. The verbs are in the plural number, but most importantly, the imperfect tense is used in the active voice. The imperfect tense in the Greek language, we're not, you know, we're not familiar with this sort of stuff because we speak the hybrid language called English. Okay? But if you go to the Greek, the imperfect tense is an action that has begun, it is in progress, but it doesn't get to finish. It doesn't come to an end. All right? Because it's cut off before it gets to the end. So let me just uh, uh, see if I can make this intelligible. A literal translation would be, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were buying, they were selling, okay? It's, in the, it's their activity, but it's cut off. In the days of Noah, it was cut off by the flood. In the days of Lot, they went down to get their latte at the local coffee shop, all right? And they're sipping on it at 9am and kaboom! It didn't get to finish. And it's exactly what's going to happen again. Because he says, doesn't he? Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man's revealed. You know what he's saying? He's saying that all of these things, that of the days of Noah and Lot, the eating and the drinking, he's talking about, you know, restaurant, club type eating and drinking, hotel type drinking, this culture of enjoyment that we're now seeing bursting forth again after COVID. Marrying, you couldn't, you couldn't have a wedding in 2020, could you? No weddings. They're, they're doing them now, both, you know, mixed, mixed and same-sex weddings, okay? Hideous sort of stuff. The buying and the selling. You know, I turn up at Bunnings, it's hard to find a par. Right. Isn't it? It's ridiculous. Planting and building 
Well, there's a few problems with building materials, but they're still building, aren't they? All right, building all their luxury apartments and homes and etc. And then all their prosperity collapsed in a day after the saints were taken away. And that's the critical thing, isn't it? Christ could have used any generation of the past in terms of coming divine judgment. He doesn't. He chooses these two. Why? Because they had a common denominator. They were times of general <coughs> prosperity. Men were living in prosperity. Now, if you doubt that we're going to be taken in times of prosperity, then I, 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 I take your attention to Revelation 3.17. This is the letter to the Laodiceans. It's the seventh and last of the letters of the Apocalypse. It is the only one that has in it this statement. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Right. That's a little bit dramatic, I know. <laughs> but you get the point. <laughs> but you get the point. It's the only one. And those seven letters actually speak, Brother Thomas makes this point, Brother Maxwell makes it in his book on the Apocalypse Epitomised, speak of the history from the times when John received the Apocalypse in the Isle of Patmos in AD 96 or circa there, right through to our time. So this is the letter that applies to the last days, to our time. What's it saying? What was their problem? Was the Laodicea and Ecclesia in poverty? Were they struggling? No. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and, and miserable and poor and blind and naked. They didn't understand their spiritual, their true spiritual state. Because they were wrapped up like Lot's wife in prosperity. And it all came to a sudden end. It's about to happen. I mean, if you can't see that we're heading towards a depression and you haven't been reading the news... Right. Life isn't knocking at the moment, but he's certainly on the top step. He's certainly there at the door, as it were, and we need to be ready for it. So there's a pattern in this. There's a pattern set for us, brothers and sisters, here in Luke 17. The days of Noah and Lot set the pattern for our removal before the era of prosperity comes to an end. And it's a fascinating fact that when you read through Luke 17 about the days of Noah and Lot, you might, there's no reference to violence. Look at the violence in America. They've had 270 mass shootings this year in 170 odd days. 270 mass shootings. Some of them appalling. You know, the kids, nine and ten year old kids being slaughtered. So badly they couldn't even, they couldn't identify them by the appearance of the body. They were ripped apart by the bullets of an AR-15. I mean, it's, it's happening almost every day or well, every day, virtually, in America. We don't have that problem here so much. But that's the kind of... But Christ doesn't mention violence. It's not that it wouldn't happen, because it is happening. He's not interested in violence and immorality. He's interested in you and me not being caught up in prosperity and losing our sight of what's coming. That's what he's interested in. Remember Lot's wife, he said. All right? That's where your problem's going to be. Remember Lot's wife. She was too tied up in her own society. All right? And she couldn't see what was coming. That's his warning to us, brothers and sisters. And of course he comes. He will come to raise the dead. You know what's going to happen immediately that the dead are raised? I want you to have a look at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12 and verse 1 and 2. And at that time, now one of the most important phrases in these verses is that little phrase. And at that time. Well, what time? Well, the previous chapter has pointed out that the Gogian Confederacy, and it starts with 1917, Builds up to the Gogian Confederacy coming to the land. So we know it's about the latter days. Okay? It's about this period that we're entering into now. And at that time, it says, shall Michael, that's the title of Christ, he who is like Aeol, or like God, right, 
He's taken over from Michael. Michael, by the way, being the only other being apart from God and Christ who's ever had the right to forgive sins. We know that from Exodus chapter 23. Okay. The only other one. But he's now stepped aside and Christ has taken his role. So when you read of Michael, your print, you're reading about our Lord Jesus Christ. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. Now look at the next words. And at that time, get it? Twice we've read this phrase. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. So who are they? Every one that shall be found written in the book, and namely the book of life. It's not talking about natural Israel. It's talking about you and me, whose names are in the book of life. Okay? This is the time of our redemption. And when we are taken to the judgment seat to receive that redemption, the world is going to collapse into a time of trouble that they've never seen in history. Forget the Second World War. Forget the Depression of the 1930s. Forget the Great War of 1914-18. It's going to be nothing like the time of trouble that will hit this world. And the violence and the corruption and the immorality that will emerge will be something mankind has never seen. So why is that important? Well, it's important because in that period it's going to be ten, nearly 10 years long before Armageddon, from the time of the resurrection to the time of Armageddon, will be a 10-year period, we believe. It's in that 10 years that huge changes will happen in our world, just like happened in the 1930s in the Depression. Stock market crash from 29th of October 1929. The Second World War started 10 years later on the 1st or 2nd, 3rd of September when Hitler invaded Germany, 1939. Poland. Um, right. Poland. Well, yeah. Poland, did I say? Did I say Poland? Or you Poland? said Germany. Oh, Germany. Sorry. Germany attacked Poland. This is what, what happens when you get old. Okay, so... <laughs> 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 yeah. So when, when Hitler attacked Poland on the 1st of September 1939, within two days, the British and French had declared war uh, on, on Germany. So this is why it's so important that we see where we're up to in the scheme of things. So in Armageddon, 10 years after the resurrection of the dead. So I want to show you what the world is saying. This is what I mean, this is what the world's saying. This guy, Harry Dent, has a long track record of predicting market crashes. He's written books and all that sort of stuff. He forecast the 2007 financial crash, the, the GFC, the Great Financial uh, Crisis, um, Global Financial Crisis, I should say. And comparing 2007 with the 1929 Wall Street crash, Mr. Dent said it was on the same cycle, but crucially this time, the central banks realised that they had a printing power they didn't have back then in the 1920s. And they just took out the cannons, all right? They got rid of the gold standard and all that sort of stuff in the 1970s. He added, so we've been living off printed money ever since. We have a great reckoning coming here. All right, he's just written this in the last year or two. I reckon they've been printing a lot more money recently, though. Yeah, and it's just created big bubbles in, in our world, isn't it? They're all going to burst eventually. Another lady, this is Anne Pettifor, who predicted the 2007-2008 financial crisis in her 2006 book. She can't say that she you know, didn't know what was going on. She published the book in 2006 and the crash comes in 2007. Warned that the world had accumulated a mountain of debt through a combination of low interest rates and GDP. Global debt now stands at US $226 trillion, which means you stack the notes up you go to the moon more than global GDP and the value of listed companies. She said, we know the great financial crisis, meaning the 1929 crisis, was triggered by the fact that investors asked if assets were really worth what they said they were worth. when well, they weren't. When, of course, people got out of investment, didn't they? And the stock market crashed, etc. We can see, can't we? We can see this happening again. It's building up. These people, and there are many more of these people, that are saying that it's coming, and they think it's going to come this year. So what's the value of this in terms of Bible prophecy? Well, it's important, because this is what happens. 1929 crash, right? By 1930, worldwide depression. And then as they started to regain a little bit of control, 
Then bang! Second World War. Right? It took 10 years. Look at our time. We're in 2022. We don't know what's going to be this year. It could be next. Who knows? I think it may be this year. Right? Same pattern. Crash. We go into a time of trouble such as never was. Daniel 12, because there's been a resurrection of the dead on the, on the, you know, before this crash occurs. Ten years, Armageddon. All right? Exactly the same pattern all over again. So what do, do depressions do? Well, they produce huge change. They change very quickly. An economic necessity that includes war, starvation and crime. Remember, it's a time of trouble, such as it never was. That will produce similar dramatic changes in the alignment of nations in much worse circumstances than existed in the Depression years of the 1930s. So what happened in the 1930s? The nations of Europe, we know, by prophecy, must be brought into the Gogian Confederacy. We know that the papacy must regain effective political control in Europe, or influence in Europe, Southern Europe in particular, which is largely Catholic, we know that the nations from Syria to Pakistan must be brought under Russian control. So they're the things that we know, and that's just a brief summary of what has to happen. That, I believe, will happen when the pressures of that time of trouble come on the nations of Europe and elsewhere. It will force them to do things today that they would never have thought possible. You know, you've seen it. What happened in, in, the, in the 1930s? America completely said goodbye to the rest of the world. You know what their, their mantra was in the 1930s, America? It was Trump's mantra. America first. Alright? We don't want to get involved in the European war. We're going to stay right out of it. It's going to happen again. You know? And countries in Europe that didn't want to be part of Hitler's empire ended up being part of Hitler's empire. Alright? Uh, Italy became part of his empire, essentially. Japan. There was no relationship between Germany and Japan. But they became partners. The Axis powers, see? So things that looked impossible then became a fact. It's going to happen all over again. So I want to conclude by taking you to Matthew 24. Where am I going for time here? All right? Can you manage it? Yeah. 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 Matthew 24. You really don't have to worry about I want to just conclude with this exhortation from Matthew 24. This is Christ's words to us. Yeah. By the way, um, I'll get, um, maybe Brother Ken can do this, but if you haven't seen the latest update that I put out, the prophetic update, it's about, and a lot of what I said this afternoon, and quite a bit more actually, is in that update. You might find that useful just to, to consolidate some of the things that we've said here today. Have you got a stick or a, a DVD or CD that it's all the time? Uh, a little bit, but not much of it. But I do have to do a talk in a month or so's time. I, I've got a talk I've got to do in a month or so's time uh, yeah. at Wilston and, and elsewhere as well, so maybe we can send that copy of that down here, because a lot of what I've said here about Ukraine will, will be in that as well. <laughs> anyway, it, this stuff around. Now, Matthew 24, 12 and 13. Let's just understand what, what we have here. The first 29 verses of Matthew 24, well, from verse 3 onwards, down to verse 29 to almost the end of that verse apply to events between AD 66 and AD 70, all right? So beyond the last words of verse 29 through to the end of this chapter belongs to our era. So bear in mind that the words of verses 12 and 13 are in that area of the prophecy that deal, deal with the events of AD 70. But the exhortation applies equally to our time, all right? And that's the point I want to make. So while these words were very, uh, you know, designed for Christ's disciples of his time, they are also designed for our time. So what does it say in verse 12? Because iniquity shall abound. Now that word iniquity means lawlessness. Because, can you see lawlessness around? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because lawlessness shall abound. The word means to multiply. Can you see it multiplying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He says, the love of the many, there's an article there, the love of the many, he means amongst his own people, the disciples, shall wax cold. 
Now that word in the Greek, there's only one word for the two English words wax cold, it's suko. It means to cool by blowing. So if I wet my finger right, and blow on it, this side that I wet of my finger is colder than the other side. I mean, that's what we do you know, in air conditioning sort of stuff. Okay? We understand that principle. So he's saying that the love, the agape love, the sacrificial love, the love of commitment, all right, is going to be affected by these cool breezes that are blowing upon them. Do you think we might have cool breezes blowing upon us? Yeah, I think so. In this technological age. And if that shoot comes from the from the shush, which means wind to breathe to blow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we've got this barrage of cool breezes blowing from the world on us. And Christ says the problem is that the agape love, the commitment of my people, is going to fade. All right, it's going to be cooled by blowing. So if we know that, we've got to do something about it. In the Greek, that word suko is in the passive voice. And the passive voice is when someone is doing something to you. You are the receiver of someone else's actions towards you. There's not a great deal we can do about the cool breezes of this world. Is it? I mean, it's just going to blow. But there is something we can do. And that's the next verse. It's verse 13. Yes, sir. The technical reason why it's colder is because... It's taking the latent heat out of your yeah. body yeah. to make make the um, uh, liquid change state to a gas. Yeah. And so it's actually withdrawing your heat. Yeah. And that, yeah, when you put that in the spiritual realm, hey, that's what's happening to me. I mean, I, I admit, I'm being affected. Why am I being affected? Because you turn on whatever, the radio or whatever it is, and you get humanism and all sorts of stuff being blown at you, you know? They're always talking about LGBTs or this or that. Mm -hmm. uh, come on. Yeah. You've only got to see the TV yeah. ads. Like yeah. the test ad, they've got a transgender person. Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So you've got all this stuff coming at you, all right, and we've got to do something about that. So what do we do? Verse 13. Verse 13. It says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now this word endure is hupomena. It means to remain behind after others had gone. And it's in the active voice. So this is not what someone else is doing to you. This is what you are doing. All right? This is your activity. This is your decision you're making. You're saying to yourself, I'm not going to let this world get to me like it's, it's trying to. I'm going to resist it. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to get my head in the Bible or whatever it may be. I'm going to do something about it. You're the active one here. And if you do that, guess what? He says, the same shall be saved. And that word saved there, sozo in the, in the Greek, means preserved. And it's in the passive voice. So you don't save yourself. All right? It's God that saves you. All right? If you turn to his word, he works. He saves you. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't that isn't this a precision in the way that that's presented? But that's the exhortation to us. And we can see these signs, brothers and sisters. They are thick and they're coming fast. And Christ won't be too long before he arrives as well. Thanks very much, Brother Jim. It's a real pleasure here for that. <laughs> If I just ask a question, Putin had said that he'll be president to 2036, so, yeah, 2036, which is the year before the 120 years are over yeah. from, yeah, right. from 1978. Yeah. And if Armageddon is 10 years beyond the return of Christ to raise the dead, and he comes this year, that's 2032, which we're trying to hold the Olympics in Brisbane, by the way. Yes. <laughs> Won't happen. <laughs> Um, he wouldn't come and pour the great big man. <laughs> <laughs> he was <laughs> <saying. laughs> But anyway, you get the, you get the drift. Uh, Putin can still be around, eh? Yeah, yeah, he can still be around. I mean, he's 69. Yeah. Mm. There's a few of us in this room who's sort of around that age, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting what you were saying about Putin wanting to restore the whole um, 
uh, of Russia. There was on the news just the other day that said, Russia is Russia, it's just a country. Yeah. But if it takes Ukraine, it's an empire. Exactly. Yeah. He, he, wants to he, restore, he, he wants the old Russian empire back. He yeah. wants to be Vladimir the second. Yeah. And, yeah. and the world recognised <laughs> you know, And he's modelling himself on Vladimir the first, who was you know, baptised into Christianity. All right? he was, that's why Putin's acting as a religious man. He wants to be a model of Vladimir the first. I mean, it's incredible. Isn't it? It's oh, really interesting to see the religious side. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who would have thought that? Who would have thought that in the days of communism, for example? Yes. You know, the communists destroyed 10,000 Russian Orthodox churches. Mm -hmm. When I first yeah. <laughs> had been to Christianity, the that was the whole the of the church. So yeah. Communism was just totally anti-God. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. What a difference, eh? Yeah. But the Bible's always said that. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So we didn't pick it up early enough, probably. But it's always said that. Mm -hmm. It was only the other day he was likening himself to Peter the Great. Yeah. yeah, and I was saying to someone earlier about that, is that Peter the Great, you know what Peter the Great did? He wanted to integrate Europe into Russia. He wanted European things to come into Russia. And Putin wants to integrate Europe into his empire. <laughs> and he won't, he, won't need to, he won't need to invade those countries. In the, in the great problems that will come upon them, the European Union will disappear, NATO will disappear, there will be this collection of ten nations in the south of Europe that will reform the old Roman Empire and will all be brought about because of necessity. Mm. There won't be any choice for them. And at this point in time, Germany is 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 not confederate with Russia, it's against Russia. Right? Yeah, exactly. And they've got to become a partner. Yeah. They don't need to be invaded, they've just got to become a partner. Yeah, Look, if I was in Germany, they're vacillating because they're, yeah, they're, they're dependent on Russian oil and gas. Yeah, and they can't get it from elsewhere, so they're going to end up, they'll just have to capitulate. Mm. But you see, they won't necessarily want to cuddle up to Putin, but they'll simply have to go along with him and say, well, look, we don't want to be destroyed like all the cities in Ukraine that have been mm. turned to rubble. We don't want all of our people displaced, you know, the millions that have had to shift somewhere else and the refugees that are flying all over the world. We don't want that to happen to us. Why don't we just be friends? Mm. Right? That's what they'll say. Yes, all right. You know, we, we, we'll be friends. Yeah, you, you do what you like, but let's just leave, let's leave us alone. <laughs> friends that hate each other. You see, Russia is... Oh, that's so funny. Russia is captain. <laughs> Russia is captain to oh, Australia. You can see the main yeah. side of it. So yeah, fighting yeah. for Ukraine. Yeah, right? yeah. And they're frightened, and they're going to be executed. Yep, that's right. They they're um, spied or imagine, right? imagine the reaction in Britain to that, eh? Mm. This is going to confirm Britain as being the principal enemy and opposition to Russia. But in that, also not going to deter the John and because, in, in yeah. the street. Yeah, exactly. That we're going to go over there. Well, 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 I'm not going to go over there exactly. and help them. So eventually the wheels are going to fall off. That's but, right. But, but the arms and the, uh, and the help that they're getting from the rest of the world is going to fall off. And especially when this depression hits, it's not going to be there. Well, they're already, already screaming for artillery shells. They're, yeah. they're running out of artillery shells. Yeah. In the end, they'll say, look, enough's enough. Mm. We don't want our cities to end up in ruins. Let's just cuddle well, up. Already in ruins. Make peace with Russia. Mm. And, well, we don't necessarily agree with it all. Mm. Bear in mind this that the feet of the image, which haven't yet been formed by the way, is made of iron and clay. So there's a mixture of autocracy and democracy. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't hold together very well, mm -hmm. does it? Mm -hmm. It can be split open pretty easily, mm -hmm. but it's there together. Mm -hmm. So they're forced, the democratic nations of Europe are forced into this alignment with the autocracy of the Roman Catholic Church and Russia. Mm -hmm. right? So. So as individuals with this depression coming, are we supposed to take out all our money from No, this don't group? bother. Don't bother because we're going in times of prosperity. Because right. Oh, are we? Yeah. I thought we were already there. <laughs> we're in prosperity now. Yeah. Um, it's, it's fading. It's fading. But we'll be taken. Just like Noah put in the ark with his family before the whole thing collapsed. All right? Okay. Just like Lot's ripped out of Sodom before the whole thing collapses. See? Right. That's the pattern. Do not. So when do we take our money out of the bank? Don't worry. Do not put your faith in your money in the bank. Put your faith in the right doing with it. Oh, I know. But I don't want to. You won't need it. You won't need it at Sinai. You won't need your bank account at Sinai. I won't need 
Thank you. Thank you. So you'll be in the presence of Christ and the angels. So. <laughs> <laughs> How would you apply that first first of all to the Ukraine, to the Christians in Ukraine? Well, Christians, if you, I don't really understand what you mean. Uh, if, if we're saying we're going to be protected from yeah. any harm yeah. in that sense, what about the Christians and how would you pr apply that principle? Well, there are Christadelphians. The Christians there are Ukraine. Christadelphians, not, not you're talking generally about Christians overall? Well, just but, ones who are in Christ. Exactly. Christadelphians the Christadelphians in Ukraine right now, are t enduring terrible things, are going to be rescued from it. Because they're going to go to the judgment seat with you and me. So yes, I know they're going to be yeah. rescued from it, but yeah. they've, they've still lost all their bank money. Yeah, and, they, and they've lost their food. So okay. that's why why couldn't that happen yeah. to us? You know, well, why it's not going to happen to us because that's one little country on the earth. Every other country, well, at least the Western countries on earth, are very prosperous. Right? We've got more. I mean, just consider what your parents had. I know, right? My parents had. They had nothing. We used to eat rabbits. Oh, I know we're yes, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, the, the Ukrainian brethren and sisters are suffering, but so are our brothers and sisters in places like Afghanistan and, yes, and Pakistan. That, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so why should we? Yeah. But the, why they are a minority. They're um, they're an exception to the rule. Okay, they're an exception to the rule. But how long will those problems last? As long as it takes. For God to accomplish his plan and purpose. We have Christians in Turkey and Christians in Iran which are suffering. We had yeah. Christians in the time of Christ like Peter and yeah. Paul yeah. and James yeah. who were beheaded and hung yeah. and crucified that suffered. Yeah, but was Lot suffering? Was Lot suffering in Sodom? Yes, no. he was. He was criticised. All right. Yeah. You you uh, you come amongst us as a judge. He was being yeah. criticised and persecuted. And and Sodom, okay. Yeah. So there's always people going to suffer. Because you know, Paul does say, doesn't he, if you're in Christ, you're going to suffer persecution. If you're doing the right thing in Christ, you will suffer a form of persecution. So that happens. But generally speaking, the world is in a state of prosperity today that it's never seen in its history. So, so, so Luke, 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 Luke 17, uh, you know, we've got the two examples, which are Lot and Noah. And the world was was very prosperous. Give up. I know on a global yeah. scale, yeah. 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 But, the world world suffer suffer but I, I, yeah. I'm just saying we shouldn't expect that we are not going to have any time. Our trucks would only have to stop for three days, yes. yeah. and well, our yeah. supermarkets would be. We're beginning to see that, aren't we? But but we are told we are told that that's the pattern, and Lot and his family apparently weren't suffering from problems of starvation. Nor was Noah and his family. So there's the general pattern that is set for us. So there may be some who are an exception to that. I know Britain that are very poor, all right? There may be exceptions. But the general rule is that most of us are doing pretty well. And that's what Christ's saying. And so that, and that's you, you, look at Lot, you look at Lot, he goes to his sons-in-law and says, get out of the city. Yeah, and they say, you're an idiot. And they say, no, 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 you're silly, you know, Lot. And, and that's really the type of attitude that happens in an Australia or England. Mm -hmm. America type um, environment. Yes. So, yeah, things are good. Yeah. Exactly. So don't worry, don't be so stupid. Yeah, so you've got to you've got to look at that prophecy as a as a prophecy of what's happening across the, the globe, not just in one little place on the globe. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be exceptions. It's always oh, good to oh, yes, I realise I'm yeah. oh, just using that as yeah. an example. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I love the message of yeah. it's really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Look, there are, there are and, people again. And definitely there are no signs of yeah. yeah. things close. Mm -hmm. Shock to him for, uh, for, for Lot because he was taken captive by the kings of the north and to be rescued from mm -hmm. him. So, you know, we're not going to be with by hand drive. Mm -hmm. But at the time that the angels came to him, you know, there he was sitting in the gate of the city and uh, everything looked to be hunky dory again, didn't it? So mm -hmm. that's, I think, what you're yeah, saying. That's the message. The, the general position of the saints is going to be in the vast majority of cases. Uh, we're not going to be expecting it because we're in a, you know, in, in, in a state of terrible, terrible suffering to be rescued out of the fire, kind of thing. Yeah, what is the message? Yeah. What is the message there? At the time when Lot was in prosperity, he was captured by kings of the north. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but he was rescued and then. Yeah, then he came back and enjoyed the prosperity. Yeah, Abraham, Abraham went and rescued him. And, and, and how did Abraham meet with Melchizedek? Yeah, yeah. after that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't start me on that. Don't start me on that.